Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the first of our keynote speakers today. Uh, Dr. Rick Hess is resident scholar and director of education policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute. He is also the executive director of the popular uh, Education Next and a regular contributor to Education Week through his popular and widely read blog, uh, Rick Hess Straight Up. He is the uh, author or editor of uh, 82 uh, articles and book chapters, as well as 34 books. Um, interestingly enough, Rick's most notice notable achievement of all those things is at one point or another in his career, he has managed to irritate, infuriate, royally piss off both conservatives through his attacks on New Child Left Behind and liberals through, well, pretty much through everything else. Uh, <laughs> he is also, though, widely cited and recognized as one of the most provocative public intellectuals writing about education policy today. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Rick Hess. Uh, I think on that first question, we'll do about five slides. Okay. Move over to your mountain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Teacher, you can tell me where to sit. Well, no, just it's like. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Rick. How are you? Doing great. It's great to be with you guys. Today. It's great. It's it's great to be here, and an honor on behalf of the North Carolina Association of Educators to be here on this important discussion about teacher leadership. So, uh, tell me a little bit about teacher leadership and what that means to you. That seems to be the buzz phrase right now, uh, with all of the think tanks going across when we talk about uh, high quality public education across the country. What does teacher leadership mean to you? And tell me a little bit how you connected that with your uh, cage busting teachers book. Yeah, yeah. I hate teacher leadership. I hate the phrase. It's because <laughs> it's you know it's how we come up uh, with jargon to actually avoid thinking or talking about things with any thoughtfulness. So we tried comprehensive school reform and we tried all kinds of turnaround strategies from about the late 80s through 2005 and none of it worked. So we rebranded it, school turnarounds. Still doesn't work, but it sounds better. And for me, what I'm concerned about is that teacher leadership becomes this amorphous umbrella, something nice. Iowa has now uh, decided that if 25% of teachers in the state are teacher leaders, if you if you designate the right number of teacher leaders, you get some state money for it. I don't know what that means. What we're talking about today, I think, is something different. Oh, we had that law in North Carolina, too. <laughs> <laughs> what, we what pushed back on it. <laughs> what we're, I think, talking about today is something actually much more useful and concrete, which is, you know, when Brian's talking about the opportunity culture, it's about a vision of how we are going to change what it is that teachers do in concrete ways that lets them do more good for kids. When I talk about cage bus, I'll get the slides up here in a sec. I'll uh, just do a real quick run through on this. What I'm actually talking about is not leadership. What I'm talking about is how do we let teachers create the schools and systems where they can do the best work? Let me just, I'm gonna take about six minutes of your time to set this up and then we'll actually get in a real conversation. What do, what do I mean when I say that teachers are caged? In, in doing this book, uh, The Cage Bust and Teacher, I had the chance to interview 300 teacher leaders from across the country, give or take. Uh, folks at the unions, including my friends, the presidents of the AFT and the NEA, uh, dozens of state teachers of the year, Milken Award winners, people doing uh, opportunity culture in various communities. The striking thing for me is how often teachers that we regard as terrific, talented, effective, making a difference, just take as part for the course the fact that they spend enormous amounts of time and energy hiding in their classroom from the schools and system which make their lives stink. What am I talking about? When you ask teachers, do you feel listened to in your school? Do you feel empowered? 70 to 80 percent of teachers say no. When you ask teachers, how would you rate the job your principal is doing? 
85% say excellent or very good. The only possible way that the 60% of people who feel disempowered can also rate their principle as excellent is if they assume that being disempowered is a natural state of affairs and not actually the principal's responsibility. Now, why do they feel disempowered? They feel disempowered because they are hiding in these classrooms, hiding in this classroom cage. When they stick their head up, great teachers talk about feeling like they're playing whack-a-mole. If you wind up serving on a district committee, it's hours of your life you never get back and you don't do a lick of anything for kids. If you get involved in school-wide, your AP gets angry at you, your principal winds up calling you a troublemaker, it's a lot easier to close the door, teach your kids, write micro-grants, do whatever you need to do without, God forbid, actually trying to make the school or system make you a more effective educator. Now, this would all be fine if teachers were psychiatrists who hung up a home shingle. If you hung up a shingle at your home and you had your coffee in the morning and went downstairs and your patient showed up, you're good to go. Problem is, teachers don't do that. They teach in these social constructs called schools. And if your school has lousy discipline, you're a less effective teacher than you would be. If your school can't handle sub coverage so that you're getting pulled out to go sit in be instead of doing your prep, you're a less effective teacher than you would be. If your school is coming on with announcements three minutes into home rooms so that you can't actually talk to your kids, you're less effective. On the other hand, schools which do this stuff well make you a better teacher than you would otherwise be. So why do teachers get frustrated? One of my favorite stories in the book, real simple, Casey Jones, a teacher down in Nashville. Nashville was one of the four pilot sites for the Gates Measures of Effective Teaching Project. There's three elements to Measures of Effective Teaching. One is the tripod student survey, 75 question survey that students were filling out. It was going to be used as a small part of teacher eval and then linked to teacher pay. Casey says, I'm cool with that. Kids have valuable stuff to say. Here's my problem with it. I teach third and fourth grade special needs kids. My kids weren't getting halfway through the survey before they were bouncing off the walls. So she was a teaching ambassador. They would show up. Teachers were frustrated. They said, look, it's nice that Bill Gates wants to spend $400 million on this project. It's nice that they picked our community. But here they are actually doing more harm than good. And they were frustrated and complaining and lashing out. And she says it was the most frustrating meeting in the world. Now, the reality is it's so frustrating because <laughs> teachers have two sources of authority. And they have misused and failed to leverage either of them, in my experience. The first is that teachers know where rubber hits the road. More than anybody else in this conversation. More than anybody in a DC think tank more than anybody in statewide advocacy, more than anybody at university. When you want to know how observational protocols are playing out, teachers are the ones who are sitting through them. Second source of authority, that every profession has an implicit moral authority. When you're a parent and you're worried about whether or not you need to do something because your two-year-old is up with coughs, you want to be able to call a pediatrician and you want that pediatrician to put your mind at ease. You don't want to second guess the pediatrician, you don't want to spend all night driving around looking for other pediatric choices. You want to be confident that the pediatrician is making the right call. And if you can't get your pediatrician, here's the trick. You want to know that the other four pediatricians in that practice are all good and reliable. If your pediatrician's great, but she's in a practice with four others, and one of them stinks, you're angry at your pediatrician because she is not making your life easy and confident. That's the problem for teachers, that they have not, not done a good job of safeguarding their profession. So even though the public thinks that most teachers are very effective, when you survey teachers, they will tell you themselves that 5% of their fellow teachers in their district deserve an F, and another 8% of their fellow district teachers in their district deserve a D. So teachers are telling you that one out of eight teachers in their district are D or F teachers. That is failing to police your profession. 75% of teachers will say in surveys that there's at least one teacher in their building who shouldn't be there. That is failing to wield that moral authority to make folks trust them. Now, problem is, on both sources of authority, teachers get no advice on any of this. Here's the stuff when you read the 30 most widely read books uh, for teachers. A lot of good and useful advice on classroom instruction, culture, poverty, communication. When you get to the stuff of busting out of that cage, of leveraging your authority, how to deal with central office, central district administrators, what to do about bad meetings, what to do about bad PD. 
there is little or nothing that's given to teachers. They're not trained on this. They don't know how to interact with it. So what happens is teachers wind up getting frustrated, and they either duck in their classroom or they lash out. The point is, it doesn't have to be that way. The teaching profession looks like it does because when Horace Mann went to Germany back in the 1830s went and, and saw how they had organized their schools into ranks and rows, he came back very excited. And so the common school era was built around the assumption of we're going to put up these buildings with cheap teachers who are going to read the King James Bible to Catholic immigrant kids so that they'll be less like their parents. May have been a reasonable strategy 150 years ago. It's not really how North Carolina is going to make sure that each of its children is ready for the life ahead of them. It's okay to rethink the way we go about schooling, and we're going to need to rethink not only how we put the pieces of school together, but what it is that teachers do. And that requires partly teachers rethinking their role. Here, let me finish the Casey Jones story, and then we'll get into the conversation. Casey was at this meeting with 50 teacher ambassadors, and they'd met three or four weeks in a row, and there was a lot of belly aching around the tripod instrument, the student survey. And Casey said, you know what, guys, maybe we can get them, maybe they're not as dumb as we think they are. Maybe Central will actually listen. So what they did was they drafted a two-page memo that said, hey, we totally understand why it is we want to value teacher voice. We understand why we want to start figuring out how to integrate that into evaluation. But you guys are doing it in ways that are dumb that you might not even understand. A bunch of us teach special ed, and our kids can't handle a 75-question survey. Six weeks later, the Nashville tripod survey was 34 questions long. Casey and her colleagues were fine with it. They felt like they'd been listened to. They felt what resulted was actually good for kids. Problem solved, and they were moving on. And you know what? When you talk to folks in Central, they say, you know what? The teachers identified a problem. They solved it. If teachers would do that more often, we'd feel like we should listen to them more often. That's the point. Good morning. And um, I, you, I really like your book. I've been reading Cage Busting Teachers, so if you haven't read it, you have a lot of good strategies, and you're speaking our language. Um, I like the anecdote that you just gave about how he worked around that issue. Um, what advice in, can you give us for policing our profession, safeguarding our profession? I mean, we have all the stories, but what are some practical strategies for teachers that really want to police their profession? Yeah, you know, and the first thing to keep in mind is people are like, well, you know, especially when you talk to uh, folks in the associations, they say, look, we want to do this, but we do have some members who get really squirrely about the idea that their job is to keep an eye on their colleagues. It creates a real sense of tension among them. But here's the problem. And you see this right now if you have been following, for instance, Ferguson or Eric Garner or Baltimore in the last six or 12 months. That what happens is teachers, as we all remind each other all the time, are public servants. They take public dollars to serve the public's children in public institutions. Part of the deal when you're a public servant is you are responsible for making sure the public thinks you're serving its interests. Problem is, if teachers aren't doing this themselves, there's going to be pressure from parents and community leaders on somebody else to do it. And legislators feel pressure, like they have to step up. Or school boards feel like they have to step up. And because they're not in classrooms, because they don't get to see all of the details, all the rubber hitting the road, I guarantee you, anytime really smart, well-intentioned school board members and legislators try to do accountability, because teachers aren't, it's going to feel less carefully designed because they're just too far away. So that's why teachers should. How can they? There's a couple different ways to think about this. One, the most obvious model is peer assistance and review. Teachers saying, you know what? We, we want to be regarded like as professionals, like attorneys, like physicians. Well, what happens is the American Bar Association, disbarment proceedings are handled by other attorneys. They say our job is to make sure that people in our profession are not muddying our reputations. And these are attorneys. I mean, they got not like great reputation to begin with. <laughs> and so what Montgomery County, uh, Maryland does, for instance, with peer assistance review, is the head of the teacher association and the superintendent, a guy actually out of, South, out of North Carolina, Jerry Weiss, who used to be down here before he went up, what they did back in 1999 was put together a program. It's half a dozen principals, half a dozen teachers. They select teachers who apply for this 
to serve as a three-year term where they become mm -hmm. PAR teachers, peer assistance and review. They do visits when principals have concerns about a teacher or for any new teacher in the system. These veteran teachers go out, they interview the principal, they observe the classrooms, they do a report process, it gets reported to this committee of a dozen, half a dozen uh, principals or APs, half a dozen classroom practitioners. They actually sit in judgment in a case hearing, and, when it, it, and teachers have the right to appeal these decisions. Never once in 15 years has this decision been overturned. One of the things it does is it makes for an expedited process. When teachers get the word that they're going to get a negative hearing, they know that they're unlikely to get it, that the association stands behind it, so they have every incentive to kind of quickly duck out rather than dragging this out. It also means that these decisions are made before spring posting period, so you have much more lead time to actually fill the slots in the schools. So for me, that's kind of the most promising model, but frankly, look, another model can be as informal as a teacher going to their principal or AP and saying, you know what, this new teacher we've got, we know you guys can only do three or four observations a year. You're not actually seeing how this teacher's behaving in the teacher's lounge. You might not be picking up on some of this stuff. So what you get is an informal working relationship between the administrator and the practitioner. Okay, all of these are really great points there, Rick, and I appreciate you um, really emphasizing the fact about teachers taking over the profession. Um, quite often, though, many of our teachers, uh, teacher leaders are sometimes the outliers in the school. They're not always the teacher of the year. They're not always the department chair or the leadership chair. And they're all quite often not always the top data producers. And that is so much of what uh, I was looking for as effective teaching is right now is focused on data producing. So um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that and how you tie in the whole well-rounded being of a qu high quality effective teaching. And how do we yeah. identify those individuals? You know, I mean, I think this, you know, I personally, um, and this is not um, conventional opinion, but I, I really worry about how much weight we put on reading and math scores when it comes to judging teachers in schools nowadays. Um, you know, on, you know good, good, good faith people are going to have good faith disagreements. I think reading and math scores probably pick up about 30 to 35 percent of the things I care about. I don't think they're necessarily good proxies for the other 60 or 65 percent. So one of the problems here is, again, I, I think teachers, you, you know, teachers are eloquent sometimes in complaining about it, but I think teachers also need to own it. Why are we putting so much faith on reading and math scores? Because teachers had not done a good job of stepping up to the plate and saying, we're going to police. And so when policymakers are trying to look across the state at thousands upon thousands of teachers, they can't go classroom by classroom. So they need metrics that are universal and seem reasonably even-handed. But I think the reality is that just that you, just because your reading and math scores are terrific, I'm not confident that's going to make you a great teacher. I am pretty sure that if your reading and math scores are abysmal, I don't want you teaching my kid. But I think there's a whole lot of teachers are probably doing okay on those metrics, but are doing other things that I value. Some of the stuff we heard at the beginning of today. They're motivating, they're inspiring, they're touching spirits, they're touching souls. For me, that is a huge part of what great teaching needs to be about. Plus, there's teachers who are doing amazing work on second languages, on advanced sciences, in the arts, that I'm not at all sure we're picking this up with any of the metrics that we're routinely using. So what do we do? I think we need to think about this the same way you think about leadership when you're looking, say, at the Carolina Panthers. Um, is the guys who are leading in the locker room are not going to be your rookies. They're not going to be the guys who are hanging onto the team by their fingernails. But you've got a whole lot of guys on, uh, you know, in the NFL who are six and eight year veterans, who are solid producers, who are good solid people with the right values and the right attitudes, who really inspire and support their colleagues. And I think we need to do a hell of a lot better job of figuring out how do we make teaching a profession that, has, that respects and rewards those folks and the things that they're doing for their kids and their colleagues. So my question is, um, in the book, you talk a lot about the solution mindset that teachers need to have. I really loved, um, and I have notes, <laughs> the six key questions that you spoke about. I loved your analogy about teachers being like MacGyver and that multitasking, save the day, moment to moment, everything's a choice. But in reality, MacGyver would be completely burned out if he was a real person. So that was a great analogy. With everything that 
teachers have to do on a daily basis and being a classroom teacher for seven years prior to online, I know how hard it is to find any time to squeeze anything in a day between meetings and lesson plans and grading. So how do they create that time? How much of a priority is that time to make that accountability and those solutions possible? So this is one of the reasons I hate the phrase teacher leadership, uh, is when you talk to teacher leaders, it's one more thing they're supposed to do, right? Good teachers work a hell of a lot harder than most of us think tankers. You know, what I always love is I love somebody in a DC think tank who's lecturing, right? Like, I, 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 when I do this as a talk, I always begin by saying, I am the last guy in the world who ought to be talking about curriculum and instruction or scope and sequence. I haven't taught since the last century. Uh, I hang out on the 10th floor of a DC office building. You know, what do, what do I, and, and I think we need to understand how hard, we, we, people say this. They like say, oh, teachers work really hard. Pat them on the head and then tell them what they're supposed to do. And like, not all teachers work hard. There's some teachers who stink. Some teachers who coast and are failing our kids and do a lousy job, and I'll tell you what, there's some think tankers and some lawyers who stink, who are coasting and doing a lousy job. So it's not, this is how the world works. For me, we spent a lot of time in the last decade talking about those teachers who are on the bottom of the distribution, the 20% who I don't want my kid in their classroom. What we have not done a good job talking about is the 20% on the other end, and how do we make this profession where they're excited to show up at school every day and not by putting one more thing on them. Because today, teacher leadership too often means you're going to be a teacher leader in a teacher voice group. So teach all week and then show up and we're going to put you on a bus and drive you to state capitol for a rally on Saturday. Because God forbid you want to spend Saturday with your kids, right? Or you're going to be a teacher leader, which means you get, after you finish marking up papers at 4.30, to go sit on some boring committee for central administration where you're going to waste two hours of your life listening to people whine at each other. Like, this is not a good or empowering way to treat professionals. What do I have in mind when I talk about cage busting? I say teacher leadership only matters when teachers feel like they are getting more time, energy, and passion back than they're putting into it. So what's an example? An example is the folks who are professionals about meetings, the guys, the consultants who go out and help companies with this, will tell companies, don't plan half hour or one hour meetings because the meeting will fill up the available space, even if you only got 17 minutes of stuff to talk about. And people will feel like it's a waste of time, and people wander around and they forget what the point is. So they say, call meetings in six minute increments. Call an 18 minute meeting, or a 12 minute meeting. We ought to think that way about PLCs. How much time do you actually need to look at what you're gonna focus on this week, and otherwise, let's give teachers the time back to prepare the class for the next day. How do we actually, and what does it look like for teachers to insist upon that kind of respect for their time and say my time has value? And how do you do this without sounding crazy? Well, what you do is there's three pieces to it. You identify the problem. You say, you know what? We're doing 45 minutes of PLC 36 weeks during this academic year. That's 27 hours per staff member. We've got a 50 member staff, that's 1,350 hours. If we priced it out, that's seventy-five dollars or $100,000 of staff time with salary and benefits. We're not getting anywhere near that value because we're only using 30% of our PLC time for actual problem solving. The rest is people wandering in late, the AP not figuring out PowerPoint, <laughs> other crazy stuff. Second is, but I'm not just going to show up and complain. I am never going to show up and complain. I am only going to show up and identify an opportunity to do better and offer a solution that would help us do it. So that's the, that's the opportunity to do better. Here's my solution. I want to set up a three-member staff committee of three veteran teachers, and we are going to review every PLC presentation before the faculty has to endure it. And if we don't meet that bar, we are actually going to give faculty back the 45 minutes for teamwork that week, rather than make everybody sit in the library and listen to a disorganized thing that doesn't pass muster. Julia King at DC Charter Prep, this is actually how they do their PD. You don't get to present PD unless you have actually passed a screen. Third, you're going to uh, present an opportunity to do better. You're going to offer a solution, but you're also going to empathize. You're going to understand that your principal is not just worried about you because you're a teacher who actually knows how to handle this computational challenge, but your principal is responsible for 47 teachers on faculty. 
and eight of them aren't getting over this bar. And so you've got to understand that your principal's responsibility is not just for the 39 teachers who are okay on this piece of the curriculum, but also to the other eight. And how are you going to work with your principal to make sure there's a win-win solution? I think if you do that, what happens is you start to change the relationship with administrators. All right, some good stuff there. Um, Rick, I've got, I'm going to switch gears a little bit on you. Um, we have a lot of outstanding teachers in North Carolina, just like Maria or James Ford, our North Carolina Teacher of the Year, or Karen Dickerson, the Teacher of the Year before him. Uh, but how are we going to continue to get the, uh, these great teachers continuing to go into schools that um, have high poverty? This is a big issue in North Carolina. We have half a million students right now in poverty. Half of those are in extreme poverty. Children uh, from poverty have a two-to-one vocabulary deficit by the time they reach pre-K or kindergarten, and that's four-to-one by the time they graduate high school. So how are we going to get those cage-busting uh, teachers into those schools and to feel empowered to do high-quality, effective wraparound services instead of just producing data? So I think there's a couple moving pieces here. One is to understand kind of what I'm talking about and what I'm not. Like I said, I am the last guy in the world you go to for advice on curriculum instruction. I know this. Um, so first off, to understand that there's actually, I think, two halves to being a great teacher. Same two halves to being a great ball player in that Panthers locker room. That there is doing your job well in that classroom, being good and purposeful about instructional technique, about figuring out where learners are and helping move them forward, about believing in each kid. I got nothing to say to that. There's great people on that. There's Farr and Lamav and Danielson and other people who are incredibly thoughtful on this piece. But there is another half, that even when you're knocking out of the park in your classroom, the thing that most surprised me in interview, spending a year interviewing these people for this book is how, like I said at the beginning, how taken for granted they took these frustrations. So you would talk to great teachers in struggling circumstances, and they would be up till 11 o'clock at night writing microgrants to get $350 for this lab equipment. Or their school, a high-performing New York City charter school, teachers wanted to meet with their students in need until 6 p.m. School policy required you have an administrator on campus. Principal would not say we need to have an administrator on campus, so the teacher had to actually go to McDonald's and Burger King's in order to meet these kids. Less convenient for the teacher, more wasted time in transit, more headaches, less accountability. So partly, this is the two halves of the job, being great at the stuff in the classroom, but also how do teachers, rather than wasting their time, change schools and systems so they can do their best work? And I think both pieces apply in these high poverty, high poverty environments. Partly, obviously, you need teachers who are going to be really effective with those children at those instructional challenges, but also we have dysfunctional cultures. We have cultures that teachers don't feel rewarded, they don't feel supported, they don't feel appreciated. Part of that's money. Part of that is the stuff that Brian's gonna talk with folks about this afternoon, is that the American medical profession has seven million professionals. Only 10% of them are physicians, 700,000. The other 90% EMTs and RNs and people who play support roles. This is why we can pay average MD salary in the US medical profession is $200,000 a year, but average medical compensation overall, only 65,000. Because what we do is we complement physicians with lots of people who are capable, but cheaper, more replaceable, easier to train. In education, we have six million professionals, but 60% are people who are classroom teachers. Makes it really hard to find people who are good enough at it. In fact, just to replace attrition, we need to hire 300,000 teachers a year. Do you know all of America's selective colleges, all of the colleges that select less than half their applicants combined only graduate 200,000 people a year? We would need everybody who graduates from any kind of an all selective school to stop being an attorney or an astronaut or a geologist. Every one of them would need to become a teacher and that would only get us two thirds of the way to our annual replacement. So for me, this can't possibly be about just going out and finding people who are good. It's got to be about reimagining how schools and classrooms work so that we can get the best game out of the talent we've got and so that we're spending a lot more time figuring out how do we leverage the people who are really good in ways that they're touching many more children. 
So I have a question. How can teachers learn to speak education policy, or do they even need to? Um, it's kind of a foreign language to a lot of those that are in the classroom, and all they have time for is their lesson plans and grading. It is, and it's a stupid language and kind of a pointless one. Um, you know, and a lot of it's about learning jargon so you can avoid actually saying it. Um, so, <laughs> so, you know, so there's two parts to the answer. One is teachers shouldn't think of it as policy speak. Teachers should think of it, good teachers, when they're dealing with parents, know how to translate an IEP into parent language. Here's what we're actually doing for your child. Same thing. When you're talking to school board members, when you're talking to people who are making decisions, not classroom by classroom, student by student, but who are thinking in terms of schools and school systems, they've got a different lens. If you're actually empathizing, if you're asking questions, if you're asking how they see the challenges, how does it look from the governor's mansion? How does it look from the legislature? If you Pretend that you believe they're good people, too, who want to do the right thing for children, but they're just looking at it from a different vantage point. Then you're asking questions, and you're just talking to them like you would talk to those parents. So I think it's less about learning the language of policy and learning to understand, I've been doing this stuff for a quarter century now. I swear to God, I've never met anybody in a union or in a state house who hates kids. I swear. There are people who think differently about the challenges and who have strong disagreements, but I don't know anybody who's got it in for kids. And so if you believe that and keep that in mind when you talk to people, then it's easy to talk policy because you're talking about opportunities to do better, and here's some solutions that can help. But the other half of it is one of the exciting things, I think, is today there's a half dozen or more organizations that didn't exist 10 years ago. There's Hope Street Group and Educators for Excellence and Teach Plus and Leading Educators and the National Board for Teaching Standards is much more involved in this work. And the National Network of State Teachers of the Year is much more involved in this. And the Milken Educators. Are much. So one of the things also is there are a lot of networks that teachers can plug into that can amplify their voice and help translate for them. Okay, again, great comments there. <clears throat> um, and it was good that you were talking about, uh, you know, teachers. No, no teacher has gone into the classroom and, and dislike kids intentionally. So I always tell people, as, pre as vice president of the uh, State Teachers Organization in North Carolina, I always tell people I've probably uh, counseled more teachers out of the profession than I have recruited into our organization or into the profession. Uh, because teaching is not for everyone, and it's a very a challenging and difficult. But how are we going to recruit the best and the brightest from our colleges and universities to, to look at the teaching profession as some place that they want to dedicate their life's career to. If they look at it and see that, well, first of all, the pay's not great and it's never been great, but it's getting worse. Uh, but how are you going to say it's, it's a profession that's not as respected as even the nursing profession or as the doctors and the lawyers when many or, uh, countries and always, we always look at the Finland model that is actually controlled by the teachers organization there. How do we, how do we get top academics and top individuals into the profession um, when so many are looking at getting out? Yeah. And it's interesting. I mean, the first part is to diagnose this properly. I talk about this data a little bit in chapter one that it's interesting. For instance, in international surveys of OECD countries, U.S. teachers take the best of the country that they rate uh, out of about 20 odd countries. They beat a bunch of countries that you usually would think of or is ahead of us when you ask about respect for the profession in that country. It's also the case that when you ask about quality of life, um, on some metrics, teachers finish last or next to last. On other, they finish first or second. So partly it depends how we think and talk about the job, but look, Let's keep in mind, like I said, the teaching profession looks the way it does because it was engineered to suit the common school 150 years ago. Remember, remember, think back to your college ed history. In 1810, three quarters of America's teachers were men because it was an itinerant profession like it had been for centuries in most of Western Europe where the second and third sons who weren't going to get the family business or the family farm would do this for a couple of years while they went off to find their fortune. This was not a model that worked well when you wanted to expand school. And so we feminized the teaching profession with this very simple idea of men would be in charge and women would be in classrooms taking orders. And we supersized that during the progressive era. 
and we built that into the fabric of the profession. As late as the 1950s, over half of college-educated women were becoming teachers. And the average number of jobs for a college graduate between graduation and retirement was about five. Today, it's not over half of college-educated women, it's one out of seven. And the average college grad holds five jobs by the age of 30. So partly the environment here is we're dealing with a very different world than our school model was built for. So I don't think we need to say our schools were built wrong or the teaching job is bad. What we need to say is it was built for one world and we're now trying to serve our children in a different world. So one, I'm not sure that you can recruit three and a half million talented professionals today in 2015 and say, here's the deal, guys. You come in and you're going to be doing a pretty similar version of this job in 2047. That's not a way to necessarily recruit the cream of the crop at NC State nowadays. It's a different world. So one, how do we think about opportunities for growth? How do we think about a profession where people might come in and go out? And I think there's upsides to that. When people come in, teach for five years, and then they go off and become architects for 10, and they come back in their 40s to teach for another 10, I think they're going to bring a lot of skills that they don't necessarily have if they're in the classroom for 30 years. So I think what we've got to be less worried about is finding the perfect model and about creating schools that feel like places where when you're talented, people want to hear you solve problems. When you're doing well, there's a lot of opportunity to grow. When you're doing great work, there's opportunity to be rewarded. Not just cash compensation because you've moved reading a math course, but opportunity to take on new responsibility, to mentor colleagues, and to be compensated monetarily as well as professionally for it. And for me, I think what's so exciting about some of the models that you see kind of floated in, at state legislatures now, the stuff, kind of stuff Brian's going to talk about in a little bit now, is whereas it 10 years ago it felt a lot like uh, this Nashville model of how are we going to, how big a bonus do we give you if you move your science, kids' middle school science scores? Now I think it's much more how do we create the room through law and policy for folks to reinvent what the profession can be? That's me. Um, you talk a lot about that traditional model of school 150 years ago and how it's no longer working for the students, the teachers, teacher leadership, anyone. Um, if, you, if we were to have a diagram of a teacher up here and they're a cage-busting teacher, what characteristics can we all take away from what that teacher looks like, does, says, you know, things of that nature? You know, I think there's three. And we've actually already touched on them, so it's just... One is these are, it's actually four. One, these are teachers who were at least solid in the classroom. You know, it, it's funny, when I interviewed the, uh, the co-presidents of Teach for America, uh, Elisa and Matt, and we were talking about this, and they were saying, look, Rick, we actually steer away from this when we're trying to train our, our, our TFAers because we've already got a problem with this. Sometimes they have a chip on their shoulder. They're like, we need to get them focused on making sure their kids are well served before we get them going down the hallway trying to solve problems for the whole school. And I think, again, you don't have to be the best on the team, but you got to be a solid player who's owning your responsibilities before you're actually solving problems outside your classroom door. Now, I think this usually means you're not going to be a first-year teacher, but I think it certainly means you could be a third-year teacher. But you got to be good at taking care of your business before you start looking beyond the door. Second thing is you've got to be looking for opportunities to solve real concrete problems that waste your time, passion, and energy. I love it when teachers start with PD and meetings and their relationship with their colleagues and their principal. Fact, here's an interesting fact. Clever, which provides the information technology backbone for about 20,000 schools across the country, has found when it surveys teachers, 25% of one-to-one -one learning time, uh, of device learning time, is wasted on setup, login, or troubleshooting. Why do teachers get frustrated with iPads and smart boards? Because an average 25% of every class hour they're spending on that stuff is spent with kids saying, I don't remember what my password is. <laughs> third thing, <clears throat> third thing is teachers can't complain about this. And here's where we get stuck. Nobody listens, nobody cares. People do listen and they do care. But they get sick of people whining. Just like teachers get sick of kids who whine with excuses, if a kid tells you, I forgot my homework, you're like, so what? On the other hand, if the kid says, look, I've got a situation at home, I couldn't do my homework last night, 
But here's, here's what I'd, how I'd like to make it up. It's a very different conversation for a teacher. Same is true when teachers are talking to administrators. And then fourth, you got to empathize. you got to make every effort to see it through the other person's eyes. And here's the funny thing. This is natural for effective teachers in their classroom. You interview these teachers, and you get, you get into a riff. You know, and they don't have to be award-winning teachers, just teachers who are pointed out to you as people who are effective, who are leaders, who are doing good stuff. How do you deal with the students who frustrate you? And the teacher will go, well, what do you mean? Well, you've tried five different ways to teach this lesson to the kid. What do you do? I find a sixth way. Well, what if that doesn't work? I find a seventh. When do you give up? What do you mean? I never give up. But these same teachers you talked about their principal, they explain it one time hurriedly in a hallway conversation. Principal says, well, that doesn't sound like a good idea. This teacher will tell you 10 years later how this idiot principal would never listen. You're like, look, all I'm asking is that you put at least half as much effort into instructing and helping your principal see it that you put into your kid. And those, that's what cage busters do. It's not about picking fights. It's not about running into the cage. It's about picking the lock on the cage. Do we have time for one more question, Bonnie? Absolutely. I love being talk show host. <laughs> okay, I see a question. Oh, my friend from Guilford and a teacher of the year from region five. My question is, is really not trying to break the process. It's more um, probably trying to get you to help me make things work. So teacher working condition survey doesn't always reflect accuracy. So a principal can have less than favorable results and be doing a great job, because in order to do a great job, you don't always please everybody. And then the opposite can also hold true, where you can have very favorable results and maybe not be doing what needs to be done. So I liked what you said about the peer review survey, but my concern is that, you know, how, does that, how do you really make that work, and so how do you see something else to complement that, to really have that give you the end result that you seek? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great. So there's, I think, three pieces here. One is you're right. A lot of these, a lot of these uh, monitoring processes that are built on surveys stink because people lie. So for instance, Boston Consulting Group got 800-some uh, teachers in a private survey, locked them up, and did this last summer. Only 29% were satisfied with their PD. Usually when you work with districts, 80 to 90 percent of teachers say they're satisfied with their PD. It's because people either are too, they're just like, well, I'm going to say nice things and call it a day, or they're worried that it's, it's going to bring it down on their head. So one is teacher, districts ought to be much more proactive about working with teachers to redesign these surveys. But teachers, when they'll talk to you, will complain about how stupid they are. And then you ask them, have they ever brought this up with central administration? And they go, no, of course not. So one, we've got to find ways to open those channels of communication. Two, what I like about the peer assistance review, for instance, is a principal will nominate a teacher as a trouble child, but nobody's word is being taken for granted, not the teacher's response, not the principal's. Instead, one of these par mentors goes out, sits down, spends an hour or two hours interviewing the principal, talking about it, spends hours observing the classroom, comes back, issues their own report. It's kind of like a case investigation, division of services, and if they got to, they'll go back the next month and the next month. So I think you're right, getting eyes on it, and a third piece, then, is for me, when we talk, for instance, about helping innovative schools succeed in a district, um, those of us who've been doing this stuff for a long time will talk about how you need a harbor master to help new school models or new school leaders negotiate systems which aren't necessarily built for them. Well, I think you need the same kind of ombudsman role to facilitate some of this teacher leadership. If you're trying to reimagine the teacher role, you've got policies and HR job descriptions and stuff in place that doesn't necessarily fit. So what I, and, and teachers can feel real leery of even going to the principal's office, much less over their head. So what I want is an ombudsman where teachers can kind of call up, make the point, the ombudsman can look into it, talk peer to peer in central office, and kind of figure out whether there's really an issue here and how to deal with it without teachers feeling so vulnerable. Thank you. We're going to have time during lunch to ask Q&A with Brian and, and Rick uh, individually. So let's just take one more question. If somebody has something that they just can't wait on, really excited about asking. Yes, Maria, go ahead. 
Okay, so I wrote this down while you were talking. Um, <laughs> We have a lot of administrators in this room, and um, you know, we really, I really do personally like what you're saying about cage busting teachers. What advice could you give our administrators on how to cultivate a culture of cage busting teachers to be most effective in the classroom and in the school? That's a that's awesome. You know, I wrote this book a couple of years ago. I did a book, Cage Busting Leadership, um, which is done pretty good. And I've, I've gone around talking about it. Um, Teachers have come up and asked, how does it translate? But also leaders have been like, you know, I'd love to do this, but my problem is I'm worried that nobody's going to take the baton. And so partly it's got to be a, a both and kind of situation. Teachers can't do this in hostile environments because you've got terrific teachers who've tried to solve problems at their school and they've been cut off at the knees by defensive APs or by principals who don't. And so that's a real problem. But the flip side is, I've also worked with plenty of principals who feel like they've tried to create room and teachers aren't stepping up. So what principals need to do is be both demanding and supportive. They need to demand that teachers operate as cage busters. You've got to bring to me opportunities for us to do better, but you also have to bring with you at least one suggestion on how we're going to do it. And you've got to understand where I'm coming from. The flip side is principals can never listen hurriedly to that half idea in the hallway and decide on the spot we're not going to go there. Principals have got to get in the habit of saying, you know what, come by my office for 10 minutes. Make sure you explain the idea to me, but make sure you bring that solution. If you only bring that tr problem and not the solution, we're not, going to, we're, we're not going to be square. But they also, what happens is veteran principals in particular say, you know what, I used to do this stuff five years ago. But you know, teachers just don't show up with solutions. They don't show up and help me. And so I've got a lot of other demands on my plate. So you know, maybe it's not the best thing. It's easy for me to get out of that habit. So principals also have to make it a mental, mental practice that first day of every year, they set the culture of staff meetings. No BMW, bitching, moaning, and whining. We are here as a team to solve problems. If I hear you bitching, moaning, and whining, I'm going to shut you down, but more important, I want your colleagues to shut you down because I want to hear your ideas and I want to hear your solutions. So principals have to set that, model it, but they have to always make time, energy, and <laughs> compassion to then be receptive to and help teachers think through this stuff when they're showing up with stuff with the right mindset. If it's not a good idea, principals have got to take the five extra minutes to explain why it doesn't work from their perspective. It's not natural. It's not the way we get in the habit of doing business, but it's what great leaders do.